So I went on the set, and of course, Francis was, I was 23, Francis was 28. And he had long hair, beard, you know, the, the cliche film student, like we both were. But everybody else in the picture was like 60 years old. And um, so we actually became fast friends. And then I said, look, I'm going to, I'm done with this. I find this boring. I'm going to go off to the animation department and make my own movie. He said, don't leave, don't leave. I'll give you a job. I'll give you stuff to do. You can be my assistant. You can do this stuff. So that's how I made a friendship uh, because we both had the same idea about things. After, the, after Finian's Rainbow, he said, you know, I don't like Hollywood. I said, well, I'm not going to stay in Hollywood. I'm, I'm moving to San Francisco. And uh, so uh, he said, well, I'm going to start a film on the road, just 12 of us. We're going to make this little tiny art film. And, I, and if you come along, I'll get you a chance to uh, write your script for a movie if you want to do a feature. So, which was part of the reality of where you are right now. It's called, it's called getting exploited. <laughs> and uh, Francis... <laughs> And Francis got me this deal at Warner's to write a screenplay for $10,000. But at the same time, I was going to be a production assistant, everybody production assistant, on the movie. But I wasn't going to get paid for that. The $10,000 was really for that, and I had to write the script at between 3 and 6 in the morning. Um, but, you know, it was, you know, I'm a kid. What do I care? I'll do whatever. And it was exciting. So we did that, and then we came back to San Francisco. And we said, we're going to build our studio. We're going to... Join together, we can make movies anywhere. We're going to make movies here in San Francisco. Of course, everybody said, especially in Hollywood, especially everywhere, even here, you can't make movies in San Francisco. This isn't where you make We've got to go to Hollywood to make movies. We said, we're not going to do that. We don't like it. We're going to start. So we started a company here called American Zotrope, and we got together a bunch of kids, you know, film students mostly from SC and UCLA, and um, we uh, got a chance to make you know, Warner Brothers to finance this company. And uh, my movie, which was called THX, kind of a futuristic, but it was also an avant-garde uh, abstract movie like I wanted to make. I said, um, they just said, just make the movies. And I said, well, I'll never get a chance to do this again, not at a studio, because this is definitely not a kind of movie that anybody would actually go and see. Um, but I did it, and of course it bankrupt the company. And... Uh, <laughs> Our, we had to, we we then owed Warner Brothers three hundred thousand dollars, which to us was minus three hundred billion dollars, and uh, so we were sitting there, and and Francis said, "Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do?" And I said, "Well, you got to pay this loan off," uh, and I can't get a job for God's sakes. I made one movie, and it was so bad that it bankrupt the company. Although it is a cult classic, I will tell you that. <laughs> It was extremely popular in the 60s when it was made because people would take LSD and go and watch this bizarre thing and wander out into the desert and find a new life. Uh, so it, and it's still kind of like that, but it was very, very big in the 60s, but in a very, very small way. Uh, the, uh, so Francis said, well, I said, well, I guess I'm going to just go back to being a documentary cameraman and stuff. He said, look, why don't you try to write a comedy? You know, these science fiction, robot movies, all this cool, cold, abstract stuff. You're, you know, you can, you're a funny guy. Why don't you do a comedy? I said, I can do a comedy. He said, I bet you can. I said, sure I can. He said, well, why don't you write a comedy? Because I'm going to have to go off and take this job. I got this, this, this job. It's the only paying one they've offered me, and it's this potboiler novel that they're going to try to turn into a bestseller. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just a gangster movie. It's, but I like it. It's about Italians. And I like the scenes where they're, they're cooking spaghetti and stuff. It's, it'll be, you know, I can do that. So off we went. I ended up writing about my lost years as a teenager where I spent every, all of my time where I was supposed to be doing homework, driving around the center of town in my car, chasing girls and uh, racing and doing other things that were getting me in trouble. But I... Research. I was able to say, well, now I have my chance because I spent so many years doing that. Now I got a reason I did it because I have research. <laughs> and so I made American Graffiti, which is about part of it was from also the anthropological side of things, which is I was very curious in this mating ritual. It only existed in the United States. Nowhere else in the world. Everywhere else there was a plaza, there were benches, the boys would go in the circle, the girls would go in the circle, and the other ones would sit at the benches. And that's how 
the made in to work. Here, it was in cars, and nobody else in the world ever thought, well, how can teenagers afford cars like that? But, so, um, as it ended up, uh, I made American Graffiti, um, and it, Francis made The Godfather. It was a huge hit. I couldn't get American Graffiti off the ground for years. You know, I kept pounding away, uh, and finally, we found somebody who might make it at very, very low budget, you know, kind of thing. And they said, well, we'll make it if you can get a name attached to it. I said, well, I can't get a star or anything because they're all kids. And they said, well, anybody. And Francis, the Godfather just come out. So suddenly got Francis. I said, Francis, you put your name on this and let me make it. He said, okay. Uh, and made it. And obviously, when it was done, the studio said, this doesn't fit the show an audience. We're not going to make it. We're not going to release it. We're going to maybe do it in a... In a um, you know, in a, a, a uh, TV movie. And with a lot of work, we got people to see it. And it got discovered, and then the studio released it and became... At that time, it was the most uh, successful movie ever made because it was made for under $700,000, and it made over $100 million. So a return on investment was better than anything. And I'd be... You know, and that would started my career, and... I went on to to uh, do Star Wars, which was I was interested in doing a film that could affect kids, and because uh, American Graffiti had affected kids, so I said I can, you know, and I studied mythology and everything, and I decided I'm going to make a modern myth, and uh, which teaches again the basics of what you have in a society, because mythology is there to glue a society together, gives you common uh, ideas about who you are about what your society is, what you believe in, what your God is, what your values are. And they used to do that, and they told those stories every year. The last time they told them in the United States was the Western. But they weren't telling him then. And I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one of those. And I did. And it's based on the psychological motifs behind myths. And I was curious to see if it still worked. And it did. Of course, and everybody else said, well, it was, it was the spaceships. We'll make spaceship movies. Of course, they all failed, but... <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's how I got, and it was a guided tour, and it was a guided tour because I followed my passion. I followed what I loved. I loved art and painting and photography. I loved building things. I loved social science. I loved anthropology, and I came together in cinema, and people said, well, how did you do it? I said, if I'd have gone to art school, I'd have taken animation, I'd ended up right where I am today. If I'd have gone to anthropology, gone to San Francisco State, I'd gone to New Guinea, I'd have made documentaries about you know, anthropological issues, I'd end up right where I am now. So it's not, you know, because the, the beacon in my head was still there. It was still, you know, oh, this is fun. And for whatever reason, I certainly did not expect to be making feature films. And even when I was there, I moved to San Francisco. We started a big industry up here. I disliked the business of Hollywood intensely and avoid it I avoided it and I did the other one thing you're never supposed to do never invest in a movie it is like you might as well you know go to Las Vegas uh, and but I decided when I had that choice of Star Wars being a success I said I'm going to try to make a go for it and so I invested in the next movie and you know borrowed money from a bank and everything I had everything at stake but it and it went over budget and everything, almost lost everything, but I did it. And I did it primarily because I didn't want the studios to tell me what to do. I didn't want them coming and commenting on my work and putting their little ideas in there because that had happened on the first two. And so what I did after Star Wars, I went back to the first two THX and American Graffiti. They'd cut like five, six minutes out of it and moved it. And I forced them to put it all back together again. And then uh, the... Uh, VHS came along, so all the versions of it now are the way it was originally before they cut it up. And uh, so it really has to do with, you know, if you keep your eyes wide open and don't have prejudices about what you're going to do and you follow your, your bliss or your passion or whatever it is, even if it's stupid, like you can't possibly get a job there, I don't want to go there, you know, all these kind of things. You know, because in the end, I got my dad wanted me to go work in his store. He was a guy that did uh, um, stationery and stuff, and I said, "I'm never going to do that." 
I will tell you one thing for sure. I will never run a company, ever. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm a creative person, I only want to be creative. And so in the end, I followed all these paths, and because I needed to make sure I controlled the vision and not have it be diluted by a lot of other people, I ended up with a company, and the company was successful, and movies were successful, and you know, I ended up running a big, giant company with thousands of people, and you know, but now, I'm still following my thing, and I've sold my company. I've retired. I'm doing little, the little art films I was going to do originally, uh, and just putting my own money in it. My friends, they get rich. They buy yachts. I said, well, I'm going to buy a yacht, but I'm going to take all the money I would use to buy the yacht. I'm going to put it in a bank account, and then I'm just going to piss it away on making movies, and nobody will ever see them. <laughs> and so I don't have to worry about anybody saying anything. Uh, so that's where I am now, and... You know, that's how you make it work. You never know where you're going to go. You never know where you're going to end up. You know, you just, but you have to be open about it and you have to follow your passion. And you'll go someplace. And if you're, ha if you're following your passion, you don't have to get rich. I happened to get rich, but that was by accident. And now I have the joy of giving it all away because I didn't want it in the first place. So it's like, you know, you, you, you get yourself stable and everything seems to work out. But if you're looking for fame and money and all those things, you'll never find it. And if you do find it, you'll never be happy. The secret, ultimately, which is the bottom line of Star Wars and the other movies, is there are two kinds of people in the world, compassionate people and selfish people. The selfish people live on the dark side. The compassionate people live on the light side. <laughs> and if you... And if you go to the side of a light you will be happy because compassion, helping other people, not thinking about yourself, thinking about others, that gives you a joy that you can't get any other way. Being selfish, following your pleasures, always entertaining yourself with pleasure and buying things and doing stuff, you're always going to be unhappy. You'll never get to the point. You get this little instant shot of pleasure, but it goes away, and then you're stuck where you were before. And the more you do it, the worse it gets. You finally get everything you want, and you're miserable because there's, no, there's nothing at the end of that road. Whereas if you are compassionate and you get to the end of the road, you've helped so many people. I mean, you know, some of the speakers have gotten up here. When you think about the thousands of people you may have helped, you may have stopped from suffering and everything, that gives you a, a very warm feeling. Anyway, I've gone way over my time, but thank you very much.